All right, everyone, welcome back to another week of Joint School Live. Uh, it is an honor and a pleasure to today be joined by Simon Fleming, who is an orthopedic surgeon here in London, who will be sharing with us his reflections and learnings from the front lines of COVID-19 and NHS Nightingale. Uh, so here we are, and here's the two of us. Thanks for joining us, Simon. Afternoon, thanks for having me. <laughs> it's a real pleasure. Now, uh, yeah, a, a few words about who you are and what you're bringing to this virtual table. Yeah, so uh, my name's Simon. I'm a, I'm a training orthopedic surgeon. I've taken time out of my, my training to do a, uh, a PhD in medical education, looking at how uh, orthopedic surgeons decide whether trainee orthopedic surgeons have competency. Uh, and, then, and then COVID-19 happened and that all kind of got put on, put on pause uh, and I went and became part of the kind of educational and, and uh, training and learning team at Nightingale. Um, uh, in my spare time, I guess, I am uh, a vice chair of the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges trainee doctor group. So I do, I do some work there. And um, when I'm not doing all of that, I guess I do quite a lot of work around culture change in healthcare. So... I started an anti-bullying uh, and kind of culture change campaign, which started in orthopedics and now is wider. Um, so yeah, I like to keep busy. Yeah, indeed, interesting. Well, thanks again for joining us. And uh, you know, this the, this topic really, what we're going to be discussing today, it's uh, it's something that we've we've had a few questions in you know, both on, on on our Facebook forums and from people who are out there using uh, the Joint School app, uh, who are now in that situation of uh, you know, getting ready for surgery, hopefully having been given a date maybe again, and there's been all this upheaval and you know, we've all been a affected in a number of ways and there's, you know, we've all faced many different challenges. And I think you know, for, for, for good reason, people were just curious to what, what, what's it been like out there on the front lines? And, you know, and uh, then perhaps a few themes around what might be, you know, where might this be taking us next and what could we, you know, as the orthopedic community in healthcare, wider society, what can we take with us from this? We're getting pretty big, big topics here. Yeah, but... nice, nice broad topics is how has <laughs> the world changed since then? <laughs> go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but so if, 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 we, if we go back a little bit chronologically, if we, like at what point, you know, because you, you were clearly quite heavily involved in NHS Nightingale and really, so, you know, so, so saw things as, 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 uh, as the, as the uh, cases were peaking and so on. But at what point did you realize that, well, wow, this is going to be something quite different from, from what we've seen before, or at least in recent years? Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a weird one now to already be reflecting on, on certain aspects of it while we're, still, while we're still in it, I guess. You know, things are better than they were, but they're not back to normal. I, I, don't, I don't know whether we'll ever be back to, back to normal normal. Um, when I think about the day when I had my like oh crikey moment I was um I was not uh COVID had started to be in the news a lot we were hearing a lot about uh China in particular and this and that it was definitely spreading around around Asia and it was definitely part of the narrative um units had started to be mobilized in terms of like the research units and I was at um I was at a meeting that was meant to be about education it was meant to be about uh, curriculum changes or, or something. Very run-of-the-mill meeting. And, um, and I got told, uh, so just so you know, the first half of the meeting is going to be postponed. And um, you're going to be hearing from this guy who you may or may not know, Chris Whitty. And at the time, about half the people around the table were like, and he's who? You know, they were Googling. This was early days before he was, you know, on our TVs every day giving us updates. And they said, and, and, and uh, uh, Dr. Whitty's going to give us an update about this virus that looks like it might be a thing. And, um, uh, you know, all of us kind of looked at the agenda of the meeting and went, all right, let's, let's see what this is about. And we got this briefing um, whereby we were told that this was not, as you say, that this was not going to be the run of the mill oh, you know, we're going to have a, a rough flu season or something like that. Like, this was serious. And it was the first time uh, I was ever privy to any conversations that talked really seriously about what this might mean for healthcare mm -hmm. and what this might mean for 
patience and what this might mean for the United Kingdom. And that was late January. Um, that was my personal experience. I know those conversations were happening before then, but that when I reflect on my, my, what's the phrase, my lived experience, it was late January when, uh, where suddenly I realized I wasn't doing any PhD work. I was just on meetings every day about this thing that suddenly we needed to make changes for and we needed to make plans for. And it became apparent that it was going to have an impact above and beyond certainly anything that I've ever experienced. Um, and that most people I was speaking to had ever experienced. So, yeah. And then as, as with the rest of everyone's life, really things kind of picked up pretty rapidly from about the end of January. Um, you know, my, my work days became very long meeting heavy days talking about every facet of our lives in healthcare and how that was going to change. Yeah, interesting, interesting. And then, for, so, and so from that, one of the, of course, as, as, as ma, 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 many will know, that NHS Nightingale became part of, of the response, not just in London, but, but elsewhere. Can you tell us a bit more about, about you know, NHS Nightingale, how that came about, and, and more specifically, your role within it? Yeah, so I, I wasn't involved in the very early stages of, of NHS Nightingale. So it was called Project Nightingale in the early days, which makes it sound even cooler. Uh, and there was this idea of having a, uh, a military field hospital style design. Um, and, you know, we were watching our, our, our colleagues and our peers and our friends on, in, in continental Europe, in particular in Italy. And we were going, if that happens here, we have a duty to have plans in place to a support the country and and for the the London Nightingale to support London in particular, um, but also we we need to have you know a life raft. We need to have a plan for if we get hit in the same way that we were seeing places like Italy get hit. Remembering that Italy had no hospital space, their doctors were you know collapsing from exhaustion. There were, you know, those terrible stories coming out of Italy of them, and this is really morbid, but, but Italy were running out of body bags. Their, their mortuaries and morgues couldn't handle, like, all that stuff. We were watching that. And so Project Nightingale was, was thought up, and an amazing leadership team was picked by NHS England, by the teams behind it, and they very wisely picked some amazing leaders with um, – uh, attitudes and vision that were exactly what we needed. So I, loads of people who were used to working interdisciplinary, so they were really anti the tribes and silos that healthcare are used to. They're much more about um, getting everyone to work together towards common goals. And one of the things that was recognized very early on was that uh, you can't do what Nightingale aspired to do without a really rock solid educational setup. Yeah, yeah. Um, because A, if we were going to have to do the, the, if you like the worst case scenario, which was the 4,000 patients, et cetera, mm -hmm. the staffing levels required for that are, are mind boggling. If you think that most hospitals have, you know, 1,000, 1,800 beds. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the staffing levels there, and also if you look at, the number of people who are qualified to work in a critical care environment. There aren't that many of them actually, in particular critical care nurses who are so specialized, so knowledgeable, mm. but because of that, it's not like we have tons of them just knocking about, right? These people are experts in their field. Similarly, we have in the UK, we are lucky to have amazing physiotherapists. But if you ask how many physiotherapists are specifically trained for turning people onto their front proning or specifically trained for dealing with complex respiratory problems, that population shrinks. Yes. So um, a, a educational faculty team, if you like, was set up in the early days to begin to design and then deliver this, this offering of both inducting people into Nightingale, the culture, the job, the, the goal, and then upskilling people, both in terms of actually the job they would be expected to do, whatever that was, and in terms of 
amazing things like well-being that suddenly were rec was recognized to be an important part of setting up a hospital from the ground up as a blank slate. Um, I was involved remotely because there were conversations about trainees being sent there and there were conversations about what Nightingale might mean if it was um, going to have trainee doctors there. Mm -hmm. And we were obviously starting to hear that this educational offering was beginning to be developed. And about the same time that Health Education England sent out some emails to trainees saying, are you willing to come back from your research to support the NHS? I was already having conversations with Health Education England and colleagues there saying, Nightingale might be a place you, you need to be because of my med ed and culture background. So uh, I, I joined Nightingale initially as part of the, the faculty um, teaching and delivering well-being stuff and communication skills stuff. Nightingale developed some amazing resources around, around both of those, both in terms of what we termed uh, psychological PPE yeah. um, and in <clears throat> terms of developing a, a very bespoke communication style for the Nightingale Hospital, recognizing that communication in a really high stress, noisy environment where everyone is in PPE is really difficult. Yeah. Um, and I did that for a little while. And then as, as with a lot of things that happened around COVID, as, as the dust started to settle a little bit, um, people's strengths and weaknesses and uh, what they were good at and what they weren't so good at started to be highlighted. And so I got moved from the faculty to the more uh, strategic developmentally side of things. So I was helping uh, design competency frameworks and um, portfolios for the staff and, and, and that sort of thing. The other thing that was fascinating there is they had, um, they had a culture of, of flattened hierarchy, but they also had a massive culture of learning. So because there was a just culture there, as in um, rather than blaming people for uh, not being good at their jobs or making mistakes or um, not knowing what to do. There was a real culture there of having a conversation about it and learning from it. And so I was part of the team there that were on the shop floor identifying what we could do better. Mm -hmm. And because it was, again, um, ingrained in the organizational culture, it meant that stuff we identified that wasn't working well could be addressed and fixed really, really quickly. So it wouldn't matter if it was, we're running out of pens, we can't find the pens because we've got the clean area and the dirty area, or, um, uh, you know, we need these, all of these things should be laminated because people keep losing them and we want to be able to write on them. Oh, and, and so that was also something that, because of my med ed leaning and my culture stuff, I was very much a part of. And, and I look back on it now and it, it the, one of the biggest criticisms of Nightingale, if you're honest, was, was that there was a certain amount of kind of humble bragging and virtue signaling. Nightingale's role was always to be there to support London and the NHS. And London and the NHS adapted spectacularly mm -hmm. but they did it by undeniably pausing and halting a lot of other things yeah, yeah. um but because of that nightingale was not required in the way we were afraid it might be which is only a good thing <laughs> it is only a good thing that we did not need a four thousand bed intensive care unit in a conference center yeah, yeah. um but as it was, we, we demonstrated some amazing principles which are now being rolled out. And the things that Nightingale did well, because it could, because it had the means, the staff, and the culture are its educational offerings, how to upskill people, how to make well-being a focus, how to take someone from any walk of life and make them be able to help during a global pandemic and um, the cultural offering, mm. how to make uh, a flattened hierarchy and a learning culture part of your day-to-day -day offering. And 
that sort of stuff is the stuff that obviously people are now giving talks about, you're asking me about, and it's because we were able to do it. Yeah, um, yeah it's, it's, it's really fascinating, this idea of, of, of finding a space to almost reinvent the hospital, sort of in the eye of the storm, as it were. Um, it's, it's that, it's, it's a, it sounds awful because, again, it, it, we were talking before you started filming about one day in 30 years' time, we're going to look back and go, do you remember that time when? Yeah. Um, but it is, it is weird because Nightingale... <laughs> Nightingale is that conversation that, that the medical community have in the pub of how would you redesign the health service? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What would you do if someone gave you a blank slate and said, build a hospital? What would that look like? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's what Nightingale was. And it's shown that it can be done. You can make staff well-being a focus. You can work people very hard and take care of them at the same time. Mm -hmm. You can make it so that it's not just people in their ivory tower making decisions, but that everyone has a voice. You can make it so that education is not just a thing that happens, but is a focus and a priority. Mm -hmm. All those things that Nightingale did really well um, are lessons that we would be foolish to ignore as the world evolves into whatever it's going to evolve into in the coming weeks, months, and years. Yeah. And yeah, you know what? Nightingale took 50-something patients. But again, its job was to be there to say, London, how can we help? Yeah. And it did what it needed to do. And the fact that London um, handled COVID the way it did was spectacular. And the fact that there are some Nightingales elsewhere in the country that haven't opened or taken patients is only a good thing. Um, but I, you know, it's like the people who don't insure their cars, like surely you'd rather have it and not need it yeah. than, than not. And, and when the dust settles and there are, undeniably inquests and investigations and all the rest. I, I think the existence of the Nightingale hospitals and their cultural and educational work will bear out as, as only good things. Yeah, yeah. yeah interesting. And, and as, uh, as, you, as you well said uh, at the start, we're, we're not out of the woods yet, so. Yeah. It's... Yeah, you know, we've got, we're seeing evidence in the Lancet that 95 to 97% of the global population are still corona naive. Um, so the fact is we've shown that in a very short period of time, we can do some pretty spectacular things yeah. as a, as a health service and as a nation. And I think that's something that we should be proud of regardless yeah. of any of the other stuff. Like <laughs> the fact that we turned a conference center into a fully functioning, great ICU in 10 days and trained over 2,000 members of staff from, you know, everything from orthopedic registrars to ophthalmologists to whatever into a critical care savvy team while maintaining a culture of well-being and learning and all the rest. Like, that's something to, to take away. That's yeah. something to be proud of. And it's something that if we need it again, we now know we can do it. Yeah. So all that stuff is in mothballs. <laughs> but if we need to... To do it again, we know how we've learned the lessons of the past, and we can do it again. Yeah, yeah, no, it's it's, a, it's it's reassuring, but it shouldn't make us complacent. Yeah, and so we're seeing some sort of a return to some kind of new normal. Is probably going to be one of the phrases. Yeah, Corona buzz buzzword, right? Corona bingo. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, and in particular for for this context for joint school, that means that there's a return to planned surgery. People are having hip replacements, people are having knee replacements, other operations, people are being booked in. Can you tell us just in some general terms, what is the sort of the decision making process around this return? Um, and yeah, and kind of elaborate on that. And because we know that from, from some of the people who've been sending in questions and topics, they're now starting to hear that other people are having their operations or are getting dates, but they might not be. And there seems to be some variations across the country. I know it's very difficult to speak in specifics, but in, get, can you get, help give us a general sense of how this is happening and what's the thinking behind it? Yeah, I mean, in the, in the broadest sense, I mean, the first thing to say to any patient is, is we've not forgotten about you. Uh, 
orthopedic surgeons have played very particular roles during the, the COVID pandemic, whether we've been redeployed to, to critical care or we've been proning people. But deep down, orthopedic surgeons love doing orthopedics and we love helping our patients. And and not, just to clarify, proning again, just that's... Is that turning over, putting yeah. people on their front. Yeah. And, um, and, and we've not forgotten about you. The orthopedic community has not forgotten about its patients. Um, but as, as things change, we're trying to come up with plans to restart some semblance of orthopedic healthcare and deal with the backlog that, that we have. And um, as we're, just as we're seeing with, you know, there are local variations in the rates of coronavirus and COVID, so there will be some variation in how hospitals start to restart their surgery. So we know that, you know, some patients will have heard about um, their surgery and, and have been told, you know, we're hoping to see you in clinic again at, at one stage or another to have a discussion. And some patients are still waiting for a letter or an email or a phone call. We know that a lot of our patients are suffering and in pain. and you know, we, we became orthopedic surgeons because we want to help you with that. And so we are desperate to be able to help you with that. But of course we want to do it so that we're not putting you or all the staff at the hospital at risk. And so there is going to be some variation. You, you, depending on where you live and what the virus is doing in your area and what burden that is putting on your local hospital and the teams there, um, will depend on, on when you get that letter, that invite either to have your surgery or to have a conversation in clinic or, or one or the other. But we, gotta be, we have to be cautious. We have to make sure that we are doing things safely, but that doesn't make it any easier for you if you're sat at home and your knee and your hip or your shoulder or your whatever is sore and getting in the way of life. Um, the other thing of course is because of the virus, the way we do surgery at the moment has changed. Yeah. Um, there is guidance coming out around, for example, our need for people to isolate at home before they come in. And of course that has an impact, not just on the patient, but on the patient's friends and family and work and all sorts of things. So it's, it's a very complicated thing we're asking of people in this, in this new normal that, that is growing out of coronavirus. Um, I guess the thing to say is we're still here for our patients. Yep. So if you have questions, if you aren't sure, if you want to know what's going on um, and we will get in contact with you and we want you to ask us those questions. We want you to understand what we're doing, what you're having done. We want you to tell us if something has changed, if things have gotten better or gotten worse. And we want you to, to engage in things like joint school become part of the narrative part of the communication stay active as active as you can within the frameworks of coronavirus whatever that means for you whether that's a walk to the shops with your mask on and socially distancing whether that is doing some exercises at home and staying fit whether that is doing mindfulness and well-being stuff so that all the stuff that is going on doesn't get you down um any more than it has to because we're all struggling but this is this is a journey that we haven't finished yet and i guess it's it's to reassure all patients that organizations like the british orthopedic association um are working really hard because in the end we want to get back to helping our patients yeah. um with the conditions that we have trained for years to fix um and i guess that's that's as best as answer I can give you as of 15th of July. Tomorrow, things may have changed, right? If, if we go down into another lockdown or if, if things get better, that's the problem both with this virus and with, with actually keeping our patients at the center of everything we do, yeah. is it means that as we cautiously start to ramp things up and get back to what we want to be doing, which is helping people, um, it may mean that the safest thing for our patients and our colleagues is to change things again. But it's frustrating and we appreciate that. And that's, it's, it's frustrating for us because we, we just 
you know, we want to help you with your arthritis and with your pain and with, with what you want to do. Yeah. Yeah. No, but, but I, th I, th I think that's a, <clears throat> that, that, that's a brilliant answer. And I think in, you know, in, in, in some ways, there, there's a there's a clear parallel in in to, in, in to where, where you were saying about how from all this uncertainty and anxiety and these challenges there are some positive lessons perhaps that we can bring into how we organize healthcare how we how, how the system works how we engage from surgeon to patients patients to other members of the team you know counterintuitively perhaps in, in a way in the, in this in this time of social distancing perhaps we can bring people having operations a little bit closer to their clinical team, be it by having more open conversations, checking in with things like remote care apps or emails or what, what have you, what, whatever it is. So, and, and I think that that's a direction of change that we've been on in healthcare for a number of years. And, and it seems perhaps that's a positive that's being accelerated. Yeah, um, COVID has forced healthcare to reevaluate how it does everything yeah. from communicating with each other to communicating with our patients to planning operations to the role of technology to the role of you know do you need to come into hospital for certain appointments well for some things yes for other things pro probably not yeah. um and and it is difficult because we have lost colleagues we have lost patients we have lost friends to this disease but it is undeniable that from all of this darkness and loss and grief there will be some growth yeah. and and when the dust settles we will be able to offer things in a different and hopefully better way to our patients and yeah. some of that will be because of this pandemic yeah. And so if we, if, we, if we sort of zoom, zoom in to the, to the micro level, let's say we're, 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 we're in that pub in 20 or 30 years time, what, what do you think you will personally be taking with you from, from, from these past months? That's a big question. Um, I, guess, I guess from a, a personal level, um, COVID has made me reevaluate what is and is not important to me personally and professionally. So I've been doing a lot of um, reflecting on what I miss, what I really miss, the things that I've not noticed and the things that um, brought me joy, whether it was personally or professionally. So um, I, I love to cook. I love to cook. But I've realized I really miss eating out. And I've been trying to work out what it is. Because it's not like I miss eating out necessarily at a super posh restaurant. Like, I just miss something about making plans and leaving the house. And, and I, I miss noise. I miss the hubbub, right? Uh, trips to the cinema and Nando's with my friends are something I've not done for months now. Um, from a professional point of view, um, COVID has completely changed the way we have meetings, which will change uh, uh, the way we save money, the way we protect the environment, the way we get work done. On the other hand, I've realized there is something about the stuff that happens um, in the cracks, something that happens in between the meetings. I miss those chats at the coffee table in between this, that, and the other where you have that great idea because you're talking complete rubbish with someone. Yeah. I realized from a personal level, I, I never thought I'd say, I miss travel. There's something about airports and train stations that actually, I'm like, yeah, I kind of miss that, that wander around the train station before you get on the train where you like stick your head into the newsagent and the hotel chocolat and you resist buying tons of chocolate. And, but there's something about that ritual I miss that aspect of it, the, 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 the socializing aspect, you know, I speak to my friends probably more during this pandemic than I did when there was none, because suddenly we're on social media and WhatsApp and Zoom and FaceTime and whatever. But actually, I kind of miss just sitting on their sofas talking rubbish, mm. which, which you cannot realistically do in the same way. 
Um, and I think in 20 years time, I'm going to be sort of proud of the work we've done. Um, interestingly, again, with a kind of different hat on as part of the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges in the last couple of months, myself and, and the people I'm lucky enough to, to work with at the Academy have done huge amounts of work around training and exams and well-being and selection and all these things that um, actually when I reflect on the volume and quality of stuff that we have produced I think there will be a part of me that is just very proud to be part of a health service that that when the proverbial hit the fan rolled up its sleeves and very humbly just said how can I help mm -hmm. I think you've created a really wonderful time capsule there. <laughs> I, think, I think that's an excellent, excellent reflection on, uh, on, on, on the recent months' uh, experiences. And so you'll be returning to uh, orthopedic operations. You'll also be returning to uh, finishing off your PhD. Yeah, yeah, that is, it is. And, and again, it's, so my, I, I'm meant to be returning to my training job as a, as a working orthopedic surgeon in April. So I've got to write up my PhD. And, um, and even that I realized um, over the last two and a half years of research, I get my best work done when I'm sat in coffee shops. And I found it really difficult over the last three, four months to get any, any PhD work done because I just can't get into that headspace at home. There's too much Netflix, too much cleaning to be done, too much other things. Right. Yeah. It, it, I'm looking forward to being able to, with a mask on and in an appropriately safe way, going and sitting in a hipster coffee shop in East London and getting some work done. Yeah, well, excellent. Well, I think that's a beautiful image to sign things off on. Hopefully we'll be there you know, before too long and, uh, and we'll be uh, able to look back on, the, on, the, on this interview and think, wow, yeah, that was a wild time. But we did learn some stuff and people are having their operations again. And uh, yeah. here we are in that new normal. Sounds uh, nice, right? Yeah, yeah, excellent. Anything else you'd want to say before we sign off? No, I just, I hope, I hope in the months and years to come that this is useful for, for the patients that are, are using it, really. Just, we've not forgotten you. No, and that, I, think, I think that's a strong message to sign off on. As ever, guys, everyone out there watching this, whether you're using the app or you're just tuning in for these videos, let us know what you think about this conversation, the other ones we've had. Has it sparked any other questions, any suggestions for topics? Send them in. We'll get to it. Of course, hit the subscribe button. And if you haven't checked out the app, it's free. It's free to use. There's no funny business about that. It's got a wonder, uh, you know, wonderful range of videos, resources, things to track your progress, and we'll be making some updates to it soon. So if you have any suggestions for the app, do send them in too, and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll dig into them too. So thanks very much. Thank you again, Simon, for joining us. It's been a real pleasure. <laughs>